Welcome to The Real Mr. Beer, Mr. Beer's own channel. We're here to provide you home brewing guidance and tips, equipping you with all sorts of beer knowledge. My name is Tim Falk. I'm the customer service manager here at Mr. Beer, and I do the beginner intermediate stream, which you are watching as we speak. Today, we're gonna to be brewing our Hop to Blueberry Cider, and this is a recipe that I came up with, actually. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, my thought process behind the selection of the ingredients and um, <coughs> the way it goes together the way it does. And then we're going to talk a little bit about cider in general. So Hop To It Cider has a five star review on our website because I am just that good. In to be fair, there was only one review, but that person was very pleased. So I feel like it still counts. It's got an ABV of 5.6%. ABV, of course, stands for alcohol by volume. This tells you how strong your beer, cider, wine, mead, what have you, is. Um, it has an SRM of 14. SRM stands for Standard Reference Method. It is a method that modern brewers use to specify the color of their beer and cider. Um, it is on a scale of 1 to 40, so 14 is kind of in the middle. It's not super pale but it's not uh, really that dark either. Well, as we'll go on to discuss, there's a very, very wide variety of uh, what constitutes a cider. The BJCP standards are pretty broad. Um, zero IBUs. Uh, IBUs stands for International Bitterness Units. It tells you how bitter beer is. This isn't even a beer. There was no hot boil done in this at all, so there's not gonna be any bitterness to this. Uh, in the same sense as there are in hops. We'll kind of talk in a little bit about tannins and how uh, tannins can contribute some astringency and some bitterness to your cider. Uh, this is a good cider for fans of dry hopped blueberry from Slanted Cider or apple blueberry hard cider from Uncle John's Cider. Our standard hop to a recipe contains one of our hard cider refills. That is gonna have three of these bottles of uh, apple juice concentrate. Um, this stuff, as you can see, isn't really thick like the HME, the hopped malt extract. That stuff is as thick as molasses. This stuff is just kind of, you know, it's a little more fluid. It's less viscous. So with that in mind, I haven't really felt the need to uh, put these in hot water like I do our cans and pouches of malt extract. You may if you wish. It's certainly not going to hurt anything. I just don't bother. Uh, as always, when you get a recipe from us, you're going to get one of these packets of No Rinse Cleanser, which is very important to the brewing process for reasons we will discuss shortly. Um, all of our hard cider refills come with this Safale SO4 uh, dry ale yeast. This is an English ale yeast. It works very well with cider. Um, it just wasn't quite what I was going for. I wanted a cider that was a bit on the sweeter side. Now for reasons, again, we will discuss shortly. Um, brewing a sweet cider can be pretty difficult when you are bottle carbonating. Um, and since our recipes all kind of assume that the brewer is going to bottle carbonate, I had to do something else to get some sweetness. So instead of SO4, I used S33. This is a Belgian ale yeast. However, I don't really like to use it in Belgian ales, to tell the truth. For those, I like T58. I like to use S33 for wheat beers and for ciders. The reason I chose it for this cider is it's a low attenuator. Attenuation refers to how much of the available sugar your yeast will consume and uh, ferment into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Uh, if a yeast is a high attenuator, that means there's not going to be very much residual sugar left. If it's a low attenuator, like S33, that means there's going to be a relatively high amount of sugar left in your finished product, or a high finishing gravity. What this means for us is that we don't have to use any products like potassium sorbate that you would normally have to use to kill your yeast so they didn't eat up all your sugar and then um, you would have to force carbonate. When we use a low attenuating yeast instead, it just kind of stops when there's more sugar left than uh, typical yeast. So it's good for our purposes. I also didn't want to strip out the, um, the blueberry flavors. Uh, like we talked about when we did our fruit beer episode, um, if you put all of your fruit in at the beginning, 
you might find that uh, you don't have a very fruity tasting beer or cider because the yeast will ferment out all the sugars and a lot of the stuff will settle out with the sediments. Um, however, um, blueberry is a pretty mild tasting berry. Um, it doesn't have a super strong taste like raspberry or boysenberry, but I find those other berries to be a little bit tart. And our cider tends to be pretty tart anyway. All ciders are supposed to be tart, um, but ours especially, in my opinion, is pretty tart already. So I didn't really want to contribute to that with my berry choice, but I still wanted to use a berry. I still wanted to use something we already sell, that we already carry and we already have with our other recipes. Um, you know, I like experimenting with other fruit like mango and stuff, but uh, since we don't sell it, I try not to use it too much in recipes that we plan to put up on the site. Um, when I came up with this, we were trying to come up with a cider recipe that was going to be good for the summer, good for hot weather. Um, and I find that a sweeter finish to my cider makes it a little more crushable, um, makes it uh, better for hot weather. Um, and at 5.6, it's still pretty sessionable. It's not super high ABV. It's not going to get you too loaded too quick if you're looking to do a little summertime day drinking. Uh, I went ahead and pureed my can of blueberries that we're going to add in today. This other can is going to get pureed and um, added to our fermenter a week before we bottle. There's not any need to stir it in. It's kind of going to just diffuse on its own. Um, I did entertain the idea of adding both cans of blueberries at the uh, at that so uh, one week before bottling stage, but I was worried that um, with S33 being such a low attenuator that there were going to be too many fermentable sugars left when bottling time came with that much sugar getting added at once. And uh, I was worried about the possibility of ending up with bottle bombs. Um, so a bottle bomb is when your bottles pop because there's too much pressure basically. There are a few reasons why that can happen. One of the reasons is that uh, there's still fermentable sugar left in your beer or cider when you bottle it and then you add priming sugar on top of that, that's more sugar than should be in there and the yeast will keep eating until there's no sugar left for it to eat until it hits that bottom limit finishing gravity. So um, with all that in mind, it seemed wiser to me to break it up into two additions, but this way we still get plenty of flavor and aroma and it's got a great color when it finishes too. Kind of purpley, real, real pretty looking. Um, this recipe does include a hop sec for the mosaic hops. I like to put my hops in naked because I cold crash all my beers anyway. Cold crashing of course refers to putting your whole fermenter in the fridge about uh, 48 hours right before you bottle. That makes all the sediment settle out to the bottom and become compact. So these hot pellets, when you mix them with your cider or beer or what have you, they're going to dissolve and then the powder is going to settle out with the rest of the sediments. There's going to be a lot of sediment from the blueberries. So if you're brewing this cider, I would highly, highly recommend that you cold crash. I do every time. I picked mosaic hops for this recipe. Mosaic is one of my favorite hops. I'll really drink anything that's got mosaic in it. It's got this great fruity tropical flavor. It's a really strong hop, really aromatic, really unique. Um, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. And I think the blueberry is kind of a hard fruit to pair a hop with. Um, <coughs> I could have, of course, just not done a hop addition at all and just had a blueberry cider, which would have been just fine. But I kind of wanted to mix it up. Um, I like the idea of having a hopped cider. And we had one, the one that had the glacier hops in it that Josh did. That was a great cider as well. Um, not sure if we have that one up on the site anymore. But at any rate, I think hopped ciders are great. Uh, if you don't do a hot boil, they just add aroma, just like go with beer. Um, I'm not sure if you could make cider beer with a hot boil, actually. I've never tried, and I've never looked into it. Um, so I'll try and find that out one of these days, but I'm going off on a tangent here. Sorry, guys. Um, so blueberry is a hard hop or a hard fruit to pair a hop with, in my opinion. Um, I tried Sriracha Ace once, um, which has kind of citrusy, lemony notes. And it was okay, but it also has this kind of herby dill sort of note to it that didn't really mesh well with the berry. Um, I used Calypso once and... Um, 
Again, it wasn't bad, it just didn't mesh that well, but Mosaic goes great with Blueberry. It doesn't really overpower it either. Um, <coughs> so, that was my thinking behind why Mosaic. Plus, I just like them, and I will take any excuse I can get to use them. So, like every time we brew, the first thing we're going to do is sanitize. We start the sanitizing process by assembling our fermenter. Um, you will note that the cider fermenter is clear. That is because cider typically does not have hops. The reason that the beer fermenters are amber is because ultraviolet light, UV light, like sunlight, is what causes uh, beer to skunk when it hits hops. Now, you might be thinking, but Tim, this cider has hops in it, and it does, but we are brewing in a room that does not have any windows at all. So just a uh, fluorescent light touching your uh, hops is just fine. It's the ultraviolet light you gotta worry about. Someone's asking uh, somebody to order them a pizza in the chat. <laughs> Is anybody feeling charitable? I'm not. Um, so we've assembled our fermenter and we're going to fill it up halfway with water. So fill it up with about a gallon. I already have a handy dandy measured out gallon over here. While we fill it up, we're also going to be looking for leaks. Make sure our equipment is sem assembled correctly. Now the reason we're going to sanitize our equipment is because cider, like beer, is a very attractive environment for bacteria, mold, and wild yeast. Now as you guys probably know by now, these yeasts, bacteria, and mold are not the kind that are going to make anybody sick but they will create off flavors. I actually just had uh, an infected batch of cider the other month. It was very irritating. <sighs> I should have done a better job at this step. So we're gonna add half a packet of the No Rinse Cleanser into our fermenter. We're gonna put on the lid and we're gonna shake it around. Mix it up real good and make sure all the surfaces that cider might touch have been coated. You'll notice that uh, the fermenters are not watertight. They'll leak a little bit around the lid if you turn it upside down. It's like that on purpose. The reason is that um, Fermentation produces carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide needs to escape the fermenter, or else it'll rupture, it'll pop, and we don't want that. We're going to pour some of our sanitizing solution into a bowl here to sanitize our instruments, which today are just a whisk and a spatula. Alright, there we go. So we have our four cups of water just like with our beer kits that we're going to bring to a boil we're going to spill a little bit on our burner too just for good luck okay. so the procedure for making cider is very very similar for the procedure to making wine with our, our cheese <laughs> very similar to the procedure for making beer rather not very similar to making wine. Wine you have to rack to a bunch of different secondary fermenters um, to keep it off the sediment. With cider that's not really the case. It can condition in the bottles just fine. It doesn't produce sediment that long. The reason I probably had those crossed wires in my brain is that when you're brewing cider, the terminology that you use for the various um, parts and byproducts of fermentation are the same as when you brew wine because strictly speaking cider really has more in common with wine. What I was trying to say is that the brewing process with our kit is similar to the beer kit. So what we are making right now, if we were making beer it would be called wort, but since we're making cider it's called must. Um, another big difference in terminology is that the sediment isn't called troop, it's called lease. That's true with wine and mead as well. 
I'm no languageologist, but it sounds to me like uh, the wine terms are French and the beer terms are German, which would make sense. So, we're waiting for our water to come to a boil, and then we're going to bring it off the heat just like with the beer kits. We're going to mix in our three bottles of apple juice concentrates, and then we're going to throw in our mosaic pellet hops. We're throwing, in, throwing them in naked, but if you were going to use a hop sack, which is just fine, there's nothing wrong with using a hop sack, I just don't really find it necessary. Um, if you were going to use one, though, this would be a good time to start getting your hops in your muslin hop sack and getting it ready. Um, I should mention as well, there is no need to rinse out the sanitizer, as the name No Rinse Cleanser kind of suggests. Um, let's see. I would like to tackle a common question while we're on the topic. Um, on our website, you might see this product called Craftmeister Brewery Wash. That is an outstanding product. It's great stuff. What it is for, though, is not sanitizing. The purpose of that stuff is to clean your equipment in between batches. And it is very, very good at that. It's just that's a different sort of task from uh, sanitizing. The purpose of sanitizing is to kill all those little critters we were talking about that we're worried about growing in our cider. Um, this yeast, this S33, has a suggested range that's a little on the cooler side compared to our, um, our house yeast that's included with our beer refills and some other options like SO5 or wheat yeasts. Um, for this one, the manufacturer is recommending, let's see here, 59 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And I would remind you that refers to the temperature of the must, not the temperature of the room it's in. Uh, fermentation actually produces a little bit of heat. So you're going to want to keep in mind that your must is probably going to be a few degrees warmer than the room it's in. So um, if you're like us and you're in a place like Tucson that's just miserably hot and just awful, um, <laughs> it, the cheapest and quickest and easiest way to control the temperature of your fermenter is to get yourself a picnic cooler. Um, put your fermenter in there with a couple of uh, frozen water bottles or ice packs. Uh, and change those out every 12 hours or so. I find that keeps you right in the mid-60s. Um, just like any other yeast though, we're going to use cold water when we mix in our must because we want our must to be around 65 degrees when we pitch our yeast. That is because um, if the must is too warm when we pitch our yeast, then um, we can develop off flavors caused by a compound called acetaldehyde that tastes cidery. You might be thinking, well, since we're making a cider, that's not a big deal. Acetaldehyde does not taste cidery in a good way. It tastes cidery in a gross way. So if you're making cider and your must is too warm when you pitch your yeast, you can still have off flavors in your finished product, um, which is always something we're trying to avoid. Um, otherwise though, the ciders are really pretty straightforward with our kits. Um, I find them honestly to be a little bit simpler than the beer kits even, just because you don't have to open the can and scrape it and all that. Only 105 today in Tucson. Only 105, Corthane. Only 105. The desert does weird things to your mind. I remember last year, I took my dog out for a walk and I was like, huh, it's kind of nice out today. And then I looked at my phone and it was 98 degrees outside. That's, that, that's not nice. <laughs> Shouldn't be nice. No, I shouldn't. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff you can add to your ciders if you want to switch them up. We like to use brown sugar or honey. You can use a cup each. You can use hops. I find that fruity, tropical kind of hops uh, are best. But, you know, whatever you like is just fine. If you want to experiment, I always encourage that. Um, what else goes into cider recipes? Spices are very popular. Um, any number of spices. We used to have a spiced cider recipe up on our site. I don't remember if we do any more. But it was a mold spider that, uh, mold spider, oh my goodness. I am just not good with the words today. It was a mold cider that uh, you could serve warm. It would be great in the, the winter months.
Yeah, it is archived. We still have, I'm pretty sure we still have all the stuff. Um, so when a recipe is archived, all that means is that we're not selling it as a complete handy dandy little bundle on our website anymore. Uh, that's for logistic reasons. We find that if we have too many uh, recipes up on our websites, uh, it becomes confusing. Oh, perfect. Josh is going to be doing a show all about herbs and spices. Uh, herbed and spiced cider is uh, one of the categories of cider. There's a few categories, not quite as many as beer. Um, we'll get into all that here in a minute once we're done with our brewing. So as usual, sorry, I just, I worry about getting our burner all sticky, no, guys, you know. Yeah. Are you done with burn? I can move it. Oh, yeah, actually, I am. Wow, what a great production staff we have. <laughs> Behind the scenes. Now, one of my favorite things to package back when I was doing a lot of the packaging for our product was the herbs and spices of when we got the, the heather tips and the sweet and the bitter orange peel and the cardamom and the coriander. And it was actually then that I learned that coriander is actually cilantro seeds. The more you know, right? Cool, so we got all our juice concentrate in there. If you want to switch it up when you're making cider, one thing you can do is um, instead of using two gallons of water, you can use one gallon of cold water and one gallon of cold apple juice. I didn't do that today because I am as lazy as I am cheap. But I have found that it improves the cider a great deal and kind of fleshes out the um, apple flavor a little bit. Does not make it sweeter though, the sugar gets from in and out. Um, it has to be 100% juice and it has to be preservative free. Um, it has to be preservative free because preservatives can kill yeast, like potassium sorbate, what we were talking about that we will intentionally occasionally add to our wines and ciders and meats to back sweeten them. Uh, that is a popular preservative because it stops stuff like yeast and mold from growing. But we don't want to add it to our cider if we're going to be bottle carbonating because we need live yeast to bottle carbonate. Um, and it also has to be pasteurized. The reason being that pasteurization kills all of our uh, creepy crawlies with heat. A little bit of heat applied over a certain amount of time. So when it's pasteurized, it's kind of, um, you can think of it as being sanitized by heat instead of chemically. We're just pouring our must into our fermenter with our gallon of cold water in there. anybody else ever have a moment of paranoia when they're brewing? Because I'm totally wondering if I sanitized this fermenter right now. Like, I'm pretty sure I did. You did. But uh, we can never be sure. Oh, I did. Good. So first we fill our fermenter up to the number one or eight point, number one or four liter line. And then after we've poured in our hot mix, we fill it up to the 8.5 liter or number two line. Like so, cold water. Now we're going to add in our one can of pureed blueberries. Remember the other can is getting saved for a week before we bottle. Then we're going to aerate our must with a whisk, just like we do with beer. Yeast are living things just like us. They need oxygen just like us. Speaking of yeast being like us, they also need minerals just like we do. Um, so distilled and reverse osmosis water do not have any minerals in them at all. Uh, filtered water and spring water, on the other hand, do. So I do not recommend distilled or reverse osmosis water. I recommend spring or filtered instead. I recommend that you avoid tap water because it tends to have chlorine in it. Chlorine tends to interact with yeast in such a way that it produces a plasticky off flavor, kind of like band-aids, kind of medicinal. 
um, caused by a chemical called chlorophenol. So we've pitched our yeast and we've screwed on our lid. You'll notice in the instructions it's going to tell you not to remove the lid. Now, <coughs> generally speaking, that's true. You want to remove the lid of your fermenter as little as possible. However, there are occasionally very good reasons to remove the lid, like if you need to be adding an ingredient, like if you were going to do a late fruit addition, a dry hop addition, if you were going to add some wood chips, um, you would need to open the lid, obviously, to put those things in, and they can't be in for the whole fermentation. So you'll have to open your lid briefly. But don't do it just to, you know, peek. I know fermentation looks cool and gross. Um, but it's better to just let it take its course and not try to look at it because you could introduce infections to your cider. Um, after about 24 hours, you're going to start to see some activity in your fermenter. You'll start to see foam, typically. Um, that'll maximize in about two to five days, which is called high krausen, after which it tends to begin to recede. You're going to ferment for 21 days total, so you'll probably be adding your second can of blueberries at the two week mark. I recommend cold crashing this cider, like I said, so you're going to want to throw it in the fridge on about day 19, so you can bottle on day 21. Now let's talk a little bit about ciders and perries in general. Um, cider is fermented apple juice and perry is fermented pear juice. Um, they may be standard, meaning pretty much just the fermented juice, maybe with a little regular sugar added to increase the gravity, or specialized. So if it's just fermented apple or pear juice, it's standard. If there's anything added into it at all, like honey, fruit, hops, spices, herbs, it is specialized. Cider isn't necessarily fruity tasting, just like wine doesn't really actually taste all that much like grapes, typically. Like wine, there's a wide range of residual sugars that you'll find in your ciders. They range from the very, very dry to the sweet like dessert wine. Um, they should be tart, which comes from malic and lactic acids. Over time, what's called malolactic fermentation will occur, meaning that the malic acid, which is a little bit harsher and stronger tasting, will be converted into lactic acid, which is a little bit more mellow and less obvious tasting. Um, the ciders, rather, will have varying degrees of tannin, like wine. Tannin uh, affects bitterness and astringency. Uh, the carbonation can vary from completely still, meaning no carbonation at all, to highly carbonated just like a um, just like a champagne. Malolactic conversion, as Josh points out, technically it's not a fermentation. Uh, the BJCP standards call it a fermentation, but uh, maybe we'll send them a letter letting them know they're wrong. Um, the appearance should be good to brilliant. Vis visible particles are undesirable. We don't want a hazy cider. Now, with our yeast selection, this raises an interesting problem because the yeast I picked is a low flocculator. Flocculation refers to um, when the yeast in a certain cycle of their life will start clumping together and then dropping out of the cider or beer. That's how you get the sediment at the bottom. Um, now, high flocculating beers means that happens to a great degree and um, it's a very clear finished product without much effort on your part. A low flocculator means that it's gonna typically leave um, more sediment and haze floating around in your beer or cider. Um, I wasn't terribly concerned about that because there's no malt particles in this and I cold crash very thoroughly. So I still ended up with a pretty clear finished product, but sometimes uh, you'll have to make a choice between certain characteristics of a yeast or any ingredients, you know, where it has one characteristic that you do want, but another one that you don't. And sometimes you're gonna kinda have to pick and choose and adjust as well as you can. So that's what I did in this case. I don't like that it's a low flocculator because I want a clear cider, but I like that it's a low attenuator because I want a sweet cider. So I went ahead and used it anyway. Um, 
The body and mouthfeel should be similar to a light wine. So again, cider and wine have a great deal in common. There's three types of apples in ciders. There's sweet apples like Golden Delicious and Fuji. These are apples you're going to find at the grocery store that you might want to actually eat by themselves. There are also sharp apples like Macintosh and Wine Sap and bitter like Dolgo Crab Apples and Cortland Apples, um, which I haven't seen in my grocery store. You might have them at yours, but as the name suggests, they aren't really great for eating by themselves. They're uh, meant more for using ciders. Since this is the beginner intermediate stream, I'm not going to delve too much into making your own apple juice, gathering your own apples to make your own must. I will just note that it can be done. Um, there are different kinds of apples that you'll need to use that you'll need to mix in a certain ratio to get the characteristics you want out of your cider. But, you know, all those standards I just read are incredibly broad. Um, if you're making a cider and you want to enter it into a competition, you can do almost anything with it, really. And there will be some category that it will fit under. So there's a lot of room to play here, a lot of room for experimenting. I hope my explanation of how I came up with the recipe proves helpful to you guys. So I will pause for questions real quick. Um, while you guys are typing up your questions, I'll just remind that Josh Ratliff, our head brewmaster, is going to be back in tomorrow to do our advanced stream. Like he says, he's going to be talking herbs and spices. Those show up all the time in beer and cider and mead, occasionally in wines. Waiting for typing, waiting for questions. We have such a quiet audience, Matt. Yeah, we do. They're so shy. I'm not going to like reach through the computer and hit you. Well, I mean, I might, but not because of your questions. Um, all right. Well, if you guys don't have any questions for me, thank you so much for coming by and watching our stream this week. And it was great talking to you and teaching you about cider. And I will see you guys next week.